Hello and welcome to this Live Faith TV presentation. We're in a course called Exposing the Adversary or Satan's Kingdom and How to Overcome It. This is session five, The Adversary's Methods on a Global Perspective. Hi, I'm Richard. Thanks for joining me. I hope you have seen the first four sessions of this uh, video series on exposing the adversary's kingdom and how to overcome it. Today, well, let me say, we've already set the stage on why we need to learn this stuff. And we've gone over uh, some titles, the adversary, and what his kingdom looks like. It's a hierarchical kingdom with him at top and many layers of uh, minions below it, below him. But greater is he than it, that is in us than he that's in the world. Jesus Christ defeated the adversary nearly 2,000 years ago, and you can defeat him in your own life if you just stick with the word and live love. Love is what defeats the adversary. Ah, Michael Knotts, God bless you, brother. Hey, Louie and Annabelle, your early birds. Thanks for joining me today. So I did a PowerPoint presentation for you. This is going to be a packed session. Let me tell you, a packed session. And you're going to praise God that you got the chance to see it. So uh, I put the links in the video description and I will pop them in here for you. Let's see. Okay, here is the PDF. And here is the PowerPoint. Take your pick. So I'm going to give you a couple more links here for your further instruction and development. First one is uh, just one I found on the adversary's influence on culture, current culture. And what about that verse about Satan casting out Satan? I think you'll find these very interesting. I'm not going to go through them tonight. It's just extra reading. Uh, for those who are more diligent in studying God's word and seeking what he has to, has for us. So, like I said, this is session five. We're going to cover the adversaries' uh, methods on a global perspective. Next week, we're going to cover on an individual perspective. But we've got to look at this first because the world affects you more than you might realize. So let me switch over to the PowerPoint and we will get started. So we looked at the word's eye view of the kingdom of the adversary versus the kingdom of God in the last session. We learned about God's divine counsel of 70 and that God orders all things according to his counsel, which is issues from his counsel. I, I discussed the difference between those two words in the last session. If you haven't seen it, take the time to look at it. We learn the kingdom of the adversary is still subject to God and is thus under the kingdom of God. It's not next to the kingdom of God as if there's a dualism, but the kingdom of the adversary is below the kingdom of God. In this session, we want to concentrate and expose the adversary's methods on a global perspective. So one of the titles for the adversary is Beelzebub, the prince of devils, used in Matthew 10, 25, 12, 24, and 27, Mark 3, 22, and Luke 11, 15, 18, and 19. It's used quite a few times. Look at this one in Matthew 12, verses 20 through, 22 through 24. Then was brought unto Jesus, one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? Talking about Jesus. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. That title, Beelzebub, means Lord of the Flies. And it was uh, used by, in a comical sense, because uh, if you have a dunghill, it's covered with flies, if there's flies around. So they were saying that the adversary, this is another name for the adversary, a title, I should say. He was the, the Lord of the dunghill, the Lord of the flies. It's a 
play on the word Beelzebul, the Greek form of the original Philistine name, which means Lord of the Royal Palace. But they took it and they showed that the devil's nothing more but uh, flies on a, the Lord of the flies on a dunghill. The title Beelzebub, the Prince of Devils, is used to show the adversary is the king, the prince over his hierarchy of evil spirits. The adversary is also called Belial in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? The title Belial means worthlessness. It describes Satan's net value in God's eyes in terms of his ability to be or do anything good. The Apostle Paul uses this title of the adversary when he exhorts believers to not get overly involved with those who do not pursue God. It's a worthless pursuit by spiritual standards that they'll just distract you from the things of God because they're not into it. So the adversary is also called the prince of this world, and the word world there is cosmos, the ordered, the, the uh, uh the world and all that's in it. John 12, 31 through 33. Now is the judgment of this world. This is right before Christ was crucified. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Not some men, but all men unto me. This Jesus said, signifying what death he should die. John fourteen thirty. Hereafter I will not talk with you much. I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. It's also used in John 16, 11. The title prince of this world refers to the adversary's spiritual influence throughout the cosmos. Throughout the cosmos. That's the title used for it. it's the prince of this world. So why does the adversary do all this? What is he coordinating? His primary objectives, write this down, is one, to divert worship from the one true God to himself, and two, to obstruct the purposes of God. That's what the adversary is all about. He wants to divert worship from the one true God to himself and to obstruct the purposes of God. In this first one, to divert worship from the one true God to himself, he does it by captivating and enslaving people through their own flesh, through the world and the environment they live in, and through spirit, influence, and control. In other words, the world, the flesh, and the devil. You might have heard that before. The purpose of that is to, to divert worship from the one true God to himself. Hey, Randy here. God bless you. The second purpose of the adversary is to obstruct the purposes of God. In the first eon, his purpose was to get God's messengers to side with himself against God. And one third did. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven down to the earth. His second even eon was to destroy God's man, whom he wants to create in his own image, thereby destroying the Christ line. That eon ended with a flood. And uh, the thought, every thought of man's heart was only evil continually, as God's testimony of man at that point. So he thought he had succeeded there, but God saved Noah a man of righteousness and his family, and started all over with the third eon. And he has a threefold purpose here in the third eon as time went on. First, to destroy the Christ line. We covered that a couple sessions ago. And later, when he saw he couldn't do that, he wanted to prevent the crucifixion. See, he wanted to kill Jesus, but not. he didn't want Christ to die on the cross. That's, that's the thing. If he didn't die on the cross, there'd be no salvation, no reconciliation, because God had said, cursed is a man who hangs on the tree. So he, he wanted to prevent, once he saw it was a crucifixion and he could not stop it, he tried to get Christ to come down from the cross. I covered that two sessions ago. Uh, his second purpose then, after, he, after the crucifixion occurred, is to sideline and destroy God's people. To sideline and destroy God's people. And C, to raise up his beast and force man to worship himself. So those are his three aspects of the third eon. The fourth eon, coming up the millennial kingdom, 
he's tied up for the first thousand years, but when he's released, he, his purpose is to unseat the Christ and destroy Christ's kingdom at the, cons, at the conclusion of that eon. But God brings fire down out of heaven and uh, devours those that are marching upon Jerusalem. And that way God gets rid of the last evil on the earth. In the fifth eon, the adversary has no purpose because he's inoperable. He's being purged in the lake of fire. So you can see how what the uh, adversary's objectives are in each of the eons. Now, as prince of the world, he's governing world kingdoms. But don't forget, God establishes kings and removes kings. Daniel 2.21 I quoted this to a person once, and he said, well, it doesn't say presidents. <laughs> it means world leaders, world leaders, all of them. God's in control. Civil government is designed to be God's right-hand matter in this world, God's right hand in this world to enforce justice. That's in Romans 13. But it's operated by men, imperfect men. The adversary is a prince over the many levels of his princes, as we saw last week in his hierarchical structure of his kingdom. Those princes are strewn throughout the institutions of this world, not just government, throughout the institutions of this world, and they influence the men in those positions. The princes are the sovereigns, the authorities, the powers, and the lords, or in King James, the principalities, the powers, the mights, and dominions in the spiritual realm. The adversary uses these individuals placed in high governmental and institutional positions to carry out his will as much as God apportions to him. In 2 Timothy 2.26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will, at his will. So another title of the adversary is the God of this eon. And that, uh, that title is used with, uh, as concerning his effect with religious deception. So the adversary is the God of this eon in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost, in whom the God of this eon has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious evangel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So the adversary usurped the dominion of the earth that God gave to Adam before Adam's transgression. God had given Adam the dominion of the world. When he sinned, when he disobeyed God, that the right to rule the earth was transferred to the adversary, his conqueror. The title God of this eon emphasizes the adversary's religious deceptions, blinding people from the truth about God and his son, Jesus Christ. The adversary is also called an angel of light in 2 Corinthians 14, 13 and 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel or a messenger of light. So the title angel of light means counterfeit messenger of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the adversary poses as one of his messengers. Guess where? Where else? In every place people seek spiritual enlightenment, even in the pulpits of this world. That's right. Luke 11.35, take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. A lot of people think they have light from God, and it's light from the adversary. It's darkness. It's not light at all. So the adversary wants direct worship. But when he cannot get it, he'll use any of the many systems he has set up to get indirect worship. The occult, religion, which is the winds blowing people hither and thither away from the one true God. The isms, humanism, materialism, atheism, self, uh, selfism, socialism, communism, all the isms. And the greatest deception of them all, because it puts a false front to the truth, Christendom. Ha! Huh. That's the greatest deception of all. 2 Timothy 3, 5 through 7, talking about these people in Christendom having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Get out of there. Come home. <laughs> For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captivity 
lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They can't put the word together because all their uh, doctrines and mythology they, they teach just causes a ton of confusion in the word, ton of, tons of contradiction. They cannot put the word together because they don't have the truth. They just have a form of godliness and they deny the power thereof. It says from such turn away because they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants you to have the knowledge of the truth so you can experience him in your life. The realization of God is what he wants for you. Now, I'm not going to go through this list much, but I'd put a, a list of some of the occult practices here, like the Ouija board you're familiar with. Now, I was a child and my parents visited uh, one of our relatives and they said there were some toys from when their child was a kid in the closet in the living room. So I, I went in there and I found this Ouija board and I was not familiar with it. I didn't know what it was. So I pulled it out, but I had this weird feeling on me. Honest to God, I just had this, oh, this isn't right. Something's wrong here. And I pulled it out and looked at it and uh, I just shoved it back in the closet. But people are letting their kids use these Ouija boards where you put your hand on it and uh, on a uh, plastic triangular kind of device. And it's a board of letters and that uh, as your hands are on that board, it can move around and spell out words for you. And that's your message from, uh, they don't say where it's from. Well, we know where it's from. It's from the adversary and his minions. But, you know, that's a good way to get your, your, your uh, children uh, headed in the wrong direction real early. <laughs> then we got palm reading, automatic writing. You know, uh, Robert Plant had the largest um, occult bookstore in England. You can look this up. He had the largest occult bookstore in England. He um, said he wrote Stairway to Heaven in five minutes. He just, in his hand, he said, moved for him. He wasn't moving his hand. His hand moved for him. And look, that was one of the biggest selling songs in all history. There's ESP mind control, hypnotism, horoscope, astrology, uh, fortune telling, water witching, tarot cards, pendulum. Look at how many varieties of occult practices there are. How many? He has just infiltrated the world with this stuff. And of course, all the symbols. And you might recognize parts of these symbols or some of them in some of the brand name logos that are around in this world. And that tells you something. It isn't by mistake. It isn't by accident. It isn't because they like the pretty image. It's because they're tied in to the adversary in his kingdom. <laughs> Whether they know it or not, unveiling 12.9, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, this is still future. He won't be cast out of heaven until partway through the end time scenario in the book of the unveiling. But his work on this earth is to deceive people. He deceives the whole world. He deceives them through ignorance and false teaching or doctrines of devil. He'll try to keep them from the word altogether and keep them ignorant. Those who do get into God's word, he tries to corrupt their knowledge of the word with false teaching or doctrines of devils. First Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit, God, speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It, they're seducing. Seducing. That's why people fall into this trap so often. It's seducing stuff that he puts out there. Speaking lies and hypocr hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What that means is that you have a conscience. We have conscience from Adam uh, when he disobeyed God. Uh, from that point on, we have the ability to learn truth from error. Uh, truth, uh, I should say, um, uh, give me a second here, my brain, get my brain in gear here. 
good from evil. That's what I'm trying to say. Good from evil. That's what conscience is. So when somebody goes and steals something, they see something, uh, they say they got nobody's around. They say, wow, I really want that. And they take it. They feel a little bit guilty because that's written in our conscience that that's that's wrong. But if they do it two, three more times, pretty soon it starts to become a habit and it starts where they lose all sense of guilt. That's a seared conscience. It is performing error so much that you have no guilty conscience about it. So spirits use seduction to trap their victims. What are these doctrines of devils? We're going to go over them in a few more sessions. But for now, you know, there's a plethora of them, but we most begin with the first lie ever told, thou shalt not surely die. That was the devil's lie. <laughs> He's the liar and the father of it, Jesus said. And most of these doctrines of devils have their basis in thou shalt not surely die. The adversary is called the evil or the wicked one in Matthew 6, 13, John 17, 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, and 1 John 5, 18 and 19. In John 17, 15, King James says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, Jesus is praying here, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil, it says in King James. They omit the word one that is in the text. So in the concordant literal version of John 17, 15, it says, I am not asking that thou shouldst be taking them away out of the world, but that thou should be keeping them from the wicked one. We're in the world by design. Uh, we have to, we speak God's word. He's commanded us uh, to do so. He's given us the ministry of the conciliation. He's given us the word. He's committed unto us the word of the conciliation to get the job done. So we have to be in the world. He hasn't taken us out when we believed we're here for a purpose to work God's work in this world. So while we're in here, Jesus is praying that God would keep us from the wicked one. So the title, the evil one or the wicked one, it's the Greek paneros, means he is the opposite of good, evil in influence or effect. That's what that word means, evil in influence or effect. A good tree doesn't produce evil fruit, and an evil tree doesn't produce good fruit. Uh, though he may pose as good, his fruit is all evil, and he does pose as good sometimes. Now, I, I talked about these titles for the adversary or the devil before. Diabolos, translated devil, and adversary means adversary and shows he is adversarial to God's purposes and plan. He att attempts to obstruct the purposes of God. Diabolos describes his direct assault on the people of God. Satanus is transliterated to Satan and means accuser or slanderer. Satanus describes his indirect assault on the people of God. He will hit you as Satanus, not as Diabolos. So remember, the adversary's objectives, objectives are to get people to worship him instead of the one true God and to obstruct the purposes of God by corrupting people. The adversary focuses his activity on world systems that affect people to further his objective. He deceives the whole world in order to conquer and divide people and to get them to be in conflict with each other and with God. He will give certain people advanced knowledge to further his cause. He only unifies people under his influence to do his bidding. We read in Acts uh, that in Ephesus that all the people against Paul were of one accord, like passion. That The devil will unify people, but only for his purpose. Otherwise, he's dividing them. He persecutes the saints and sidelines them gets them out of the picture so they can't affect him or his kingdom. He corrupts doctrine through translation and wrong teaching to weaken the people of God. And the secrecy of the adversary's success is in the secrecy of his moves. 2 Thessalonians 2.7, King James Version. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now uh, letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, there's a better translation in the concordant little, literal version, 2 Thessalonians 2.7, for the secret of lawlessness is already operating, 
only when the present detainer may be coming to be out of the midst. So the secret of the adversary's success is in the secrecy of his moves. He works behind the scenes. He doesn't come out in the open often and expose himself because people would run the other way. So he hides behind the scenes. He works through his minions to affect the world, which in effect uh, affects people. That's his methodologies. So the dragon, the title of the dragon is used in spiritual warfare. The adversary is the dragon. The unveiling of Revelation 12, 13, uh, verses 3 and 4. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The title dragon refers to the adversary's involvement in spiritual warfare. He is vicious and deadly. You can see here that his purpose in dragging those third stars of heaven was to stand before the woman, Israel, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the adversary is the dragon. I believe the seven heads represent the seven governments that have oppressed God's people Israel from their inception. The first is Egypt. The second is Assyria. The third is Babylon. The fourth is the Medo-Persian Empire. The fifth is Greece. The sixth is Rome. And the seventh is the, was the Islamic Caliphate that got broken up after World War I. The eighth king represents up, uh, I'm sorry, the eighth king appears in the upcoming wrath period and is one of the seven, unveiling 17, 9 through 11. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And they say, oh, that's Rome. Rome was built on seven mountains. Well, mountains in the word represents kingdoms, kingdoms. And it's going to tell you it's talking about kingdoms in verse 10. And there are seven kings. By the way, the word kings and kingdoms is interchangeable, both in Daniel and in the unveiling. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. He's talking to John in the first century. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is one of the seven and goes into perdition. What does this riddle mean? This stumped me for years. There are seven kings. That's the seven heads on the seven mountains, seven kings on seven kingdoms. Five are fallen. One is, at the time John was writing this, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. So that's seven kings. Five and one is six, and the other not yet come is seven. And eleven, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes to perdition. So that's the eighth one. What does this riddle mean? Look at unveiling 13, one through nine. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. We have the same description of the beast as we have of the dragon. The same description. And the, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. We're going back to Daniel's descriptions now of these kingdoms. The beast which I saw was like, like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. We cannot interpret this by modern uh, means, uh, you know, like the bear is is uh, Russia, right? We have to go back to Daniel because the word interprets itself by its own scripture. So we go back to Daniel to see what these are. And that's not really the subject of tonight, but just a little clue there. So you don't get uh, carried away by wrong doctrine again. I saw one of his heads, one of those seven heads, as if it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? This verse 3 
has been interpreted to say the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to be assassinated and then rise from the dead. Well, the only way somebody can rise from the dead is if God raises them from the dead. And I don't think that's what this is talking about. So the beast that shall come rises up out of the sea. The sea represents the Gentile nations because they're always moving around. They're not stable. He bears the same, and the, the land, by the way, refers to Israel, the land. So he bears the same, this, this beast bears the same description as his father, the adversary, in his role as dragon for spiritual warfare. Notice, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So for man to accomplish anything in this world, he must have spiritual help. He must, because the adversary is the prince of the world. And he doesn't give up his kingdom. Uh, he doesn't give rights to rule any part of his kingdom easily. People have to submit to him. So uh, either knowledgeably or not knowledgeably. The beast's authority comes from the dragon. That's where it comes from. But even now, as always, the kings of the earth draw and are influenced by the adversary. So they get their authority from the adversary, but remember who who the adversary gets his authority from. It's from God. Look at Daniel 10, 5, 6, 12, and 13. This is New King James Version. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of upaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. So we can see some spiritual activity here. This is an angel talking with Daniel. He says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So I would have got to you sooner, Daniel, but I had this uh, spiritual thing going on here. And, and I couldn't handle them myself. So Michael had to come. One of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Uh, Daniel 10, 20 and 21, New Revised Standard Version. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? Now I must return to fight the prince of Persia. And when I am through with him, the prince of Greece will come. But I am to tell you that which is inscribed in the book of truth. There is no one with me who contends against these princes except Michael, your prince. So this describes the opposition to God's will by the spirit beings of the council, the sovereignties, authorities, powers, and lords in the spiritual realm who have been given rule over the nations. We have it <clears throat> chronicled here in the book of Daniel. Daniel 8.10, New King James Version. And it, the little horn, grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars, some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So this little horn grew up to the host of heaven. What's this host of heaven? It's the council of God, C-I-L, council of God. It cast down some of the host. That's pretty powerful. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of the stars to the ground. Stars is put for, for uh, angels, messengers. And trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. We see from Daniel 8 that the Antichrist will come against these spiritual powers. He's the little horn, the stars, and cast down some of them and trample them. The remainder will join his end-time rebellion. Isaiah 24, 19 through 22. The earth is broken asunder, and the earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. So it will happen in that day 
that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on, on the earth below, the kings of the earth on earth. He's not going to punish the moon, the stars, and the planets. This host of heaven, this uh, host of heaven on high, these are spiritual beings. And they're in concert with the kings of the earth below. So they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison. After many days, they will be punished. The host of heaven ruling from on high are differentiated from the kings of the earth ruling on the earth below. But the decisions and actions those kings take is inspired by the host of heaven. Daniel 4, 13 through 15. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a brand of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Mind you, this is talking about, this is a, uh, a vision about Nebuchadnezzar, who God was going to turn into an animal <laughs> for seven years. But a watcher comes down, and announces this, a watcher, Daniel 4, 16 and 17. Let, us, let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given unto him. Let seven times pass over him, seven years. This matter is by the decree of what? The watchers. This is the host of God. This is the counsel of God, different terms for it. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over and sits sets up over it the basest of men. So who's in charge of the council? God. And they're called the watchers. Clearly we see the council of God, the watchers, issuing this command that affects Nebuchadnezzar, the supreme authority on earth over Babylon at that time. But still, it's the Most High God that rules all. Second Chronicles 13, 18 through 20, New King James Version. Then Micah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. It's not talking about the planets. It's talking about this council, the spiritual beings, the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. The sovereignties, authorities, uh, powers, and lords. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fail at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, one spoke in that manner. They're all coming up with ideas in this council. We have a bird's eye or God's eye view of this council in action here. The only place in the word we have it. Then, verse 20, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, a spirit. And said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way will you persuade him? So in verse 18, so he, the spirit said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. So God is commanding this unclean spirit to lie to uh Ahab's prophets. Therefore, look, the Lord has put the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets, those uh, of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. So again, we see the counsel of God, the host of heaven, and I'm not going to try to say the Hebrew word. I've got it there for you. And God issuing this command that affects Ahab, the king of Israel. So. <laughs> The New Bible Dictionary says this about the host of heaven. The phrase, I'll try to say it, Treva Hashemayim, occurs about 15 times, in most cases implying the object of the heathen worship in Deuteronomy 4.19, etc. The two meanings, celestial bodies and angelic beings, are inextricably intertwined. The Septuagint translation, using cosmos, stratia, or dynamis, 
does not help to resolve this issue. No doubt to the Hebrew mind, the distinction was superficial and the celestial bodies were thought to be closely associated with heavenly beings. Wouldn't be su surprise me if there's spirits over those too. So the Bible certainly suggests that these spirit beings of different ranks have charge of individuals and of nations. No doubt in the light of modern cosmology, this concept, if retained at all, as biblically it must be, ought properly to be extended as the dual sense of the phrase host of heaven suggests to the oversight of the elements of the physical universe, the planets, the stars, the nebulae. That's from page 495 of the Bible dictionary, host, host of heaven. So the target of the adversary's attacks. From surveying the Old and New Testaments, we can clearly see that the adversary targets the people of God and not God directly. He cannot target God directly, for that would be sheer folly. We saw in an earlier session that the adversary tried to wipe out the bloodline to the Messiah multiple times. Having failed to prevent the Messiah's earthly ministry, he then changed his tactics and tried to get him to exert his sonship power and get him to come down off the cross. That's when uh, all the people and the two thieves and one of the malefactors railed on him, saying, if you're the son of God, come down, save yourself <laughs> and us. <laughs> Uh, the, in fact, the uh, scribes and Pharisees even said, well, if he's the son of God, let him come down now and we will believe him. What a temptation. Wasn't Jesus, you know, hoping they would believe in him? So all he had to do was get down off the cross. He would have had the whole Sanhedrin. But no, he held his ground. He stayed because he knew what God's will was. So when, when that failed, when, it failed, when the adversary failed to get him down off the cross, the adversary knew he had no other option. So he and his host have been disarmed, but have not yet been taken out. So the adversary is called the chief of the jurisdiction of the air. In Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, King James Version. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's a wrong translation. We'll get to the right one in a minute. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, the eon of this world, it should read, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. A better translation is Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 in the concordant literal version. And you, believer, being dead to your offenses and sins because of what Christ did, you being dead to your offenses and sins, in once you walk, in, in, in which you once walked, in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit that now operates in the sons of stubbornness. So the title, the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, refers to the adversary's sphere of attack, our environment, our atmosphere. Uh, he's in our hair, so to speak. Ephesians 3, 1 to 3. Concordant literal version. I'll read it again. You being dead to your offenses and sins in once in which you once walked in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit now operating in the sons of stubbornness, among whom also we behaved ourselves once in the lusts of the flesh, doing the will of the flesh and of the comprehension, the flesh and the mind, and were in were in our nature children of indignation, even as the rest. Now, the word for nature is the Greek word uh, physi, which can be translated instinctively. Our instincts, that which we act out of, were to do that which our flesh dictated, what our mind dictated. And we learn from the others. You know, it's according to what we learn from others, our environment, and possibly from unclean spirits directly. That's where we got that stuff, from our flesh, from others, from our environment, and possibly from unclean spirits directly. The title, the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, refers to the adversary's sphere of attack, our environment and atmosphere. The adversary uses people who do not have the knowledge of God to carry out his directives. These people are called children of stubbornness and children of wrath in those verses in Ephesians. Sons of stubbornness and children of indignation, 
or wrath, the word indignation means wrath, are titles for soulish man. King James Version has sons of disobedience for sons of stubbornness. The soulish, soilish man cannot please God. Romans 8, 5 through 9. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 2, 4 through 7. Or are you despising the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Being ignorant that the kindness of God is leading you to repentance? Verse 5, yet in accord with your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are hoarding to yourselves indignation in the day of indignation and the revelation of the just judgment of God, who will be paying each one according with his acts. To those indeed who are by endurance in good acts are seeking glory and honor and incorruption, life eonian. Verse 8, yet to those of faction and stubborn, indeed, as to the truth, yet persuaded to injustice, indignation, or wrath and fury, affliction and distress upon every so human soul which is affecting evil, both of the Jew first and of the Greek. Yet glory and honor and peace to every worker of good, both to the Jew first and to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So we see the children of wrath are the children of disobedience. Ephesians 3, 1 through 3, concordant literal version. You being dead to your offenses and sins in the which you once walked in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit now operating in the sons of stubbornness, among whom also we all behaved ourselves once in the lusts of our flesh, doing the will of the flesh and of the comprehension, and were in our nature children of indignation, even as the rest." Notice that it's the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit now operating in them. This is why the Ephesians 6 tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Let's look at that. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Hey, Kevin. Bartley, God bless you, sir. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Put on the panoply of God to enable you to stand up to the stratagems of the adversary. For it is not ours to wrestle with flesh and blood, but with the sovereignties, with the authorities, with the world mights. And that's the Greek word cosmokratis. It means world impactors. I'll show you that in a minute. The world impactors of this darkness with the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. Cosmokratis is made up of the Greek word cosmos, which means the world, the created order. And kratis, exerted powder. Now, I explained this before. There's three Greek words for power. One is dunamis. It's inherent power. That's what we all have as sons of God. We have dunamis. And then we, there's the word zousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A, E-X-S-O-U-S-A. It's uh, authority. It's the authority to exercise that dunamis. And there's a third word, world, word called kratos. That's impacted power. Kratos is the impact point, like when a boxer hits somebody in the face. The point of impact is kratos. It's exerted power. So the adversary marshals his world impactors of darkness. They're world impactors. <laughs> These are the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. So the currents or the trends, the popular world trends that blow through our world are inspired by the adversary, and there have been many since the beginning of time. People are not the object of our warfare. These spirits are. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We're going to cover that in much more detail next session. Uh, I'm sorry, the session after next. So man, let's talk about the word inspiration. Man is a spiritual being. He's made up of the spirit of man 
which was combined with breathed into the lifeless flesh and man became a living soul. So man is a spiritual being. It says in James that the body without the spirit is dead. So we're talking about not Holy Spirit, but the spirit of man. Man is a spiritual being. The spirit of man cannot know the things of the spirit of God. That's 1 Corinthians 2. Unable to discern the source of his mental promptings, man is impervious to the adversary's promptings through his agents. He can't tell the difference because he cannot discern spiritual things. So in this way and through structured circumstances, the adversary inspires the soulish man to do his bidding, unawares to the man, unawares. The word, you know, he gets a thought and he thinks it's his thought. It's not. Many times, the ones he's controlling here, the, the thoughts are coming from the adversary. The word inspiration literally means in spirit action. In spirit action. The spirit teaches the mind. We will discuss the source of man's thoughts when we get to the session on how to stand against the methodologies of the adversary, which is two sessions from now. There's four uh, sources of man's thoughts. Talk about world trends. All the world trends in the history of the world were and are inspired and prompted by the adversary and his minions. Remember that the adversary doesn't have a, doesn't give a hoot about this world. He'd rather see it destroyed along with all of mankind. He most often poses as good to accomplish his purposes. You don't, one uh, great teacher said, you, you don't gain many followers by knocking babies off their tricycles. <laughs> Kevin will appreciate that one. He often gives money, the adversary often gives money, possessions, and power to advance his actions, but those always come at a cost to their recipients. Always comes at a cost. People think they're getting something from the adversary. It's going to cost them big time. So part of these world trends are the four major world religions. The book of Daniel has an interesting chapter that reveals the four major world religions. Daniel 7, 1 through 3. In year one of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel, per Daniel perceives a dream, even visions in his head on his bed. I love that phrase. It's poetic. I'm going to have to put it in a song. He has visions of his head on his bed. Then he writes the dream which he had perceived, stating a summary of the matters. Daniel is responding as follows. Perceiving am I in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heavens are rushing forth to the vast sea, and four monstrous animals are coming up from the sea, diverse one from another. So the four winds of heaven refers to the spiritual forces of darkness. The vast sea refers to the Gentile nations, as I explained earlier. The four monstrous animals coming out from the sea refer to the product or result of those spiritual forces working among people. Each of these four winds represents a different world religion. Believers are not to be blown about hither and thither by these winds of darkness might bring Ephesians 4 to your mind, that uh, uh, Christ has given Doria gifts, presents to the church, which are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the adjusting of the saints with a view to uh, the work of the ministry, with a further view to the edifying of the body of Christ, uh, with the view that, not until, with the view that we all come in the unity of faith under the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man is that word, unto the fullness of the stature of Christ. So it's, and it says that we not be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. These are these winds, four winds of the heaven. They refer to force, the spiritual forces of darkness. The vast sea refers to the Gentile nations. The four monstrous animals coming up from the sea refer to the product or result of those spiritual forces working among the masses of people, the nations. Each of these four winds represents a different world religion. Believers are not to be blown about hither and thither by these winds of darkness. Daniel 7, 9 through 12. Perce perceiving am I till thrones were placed in the transfer of days. King James has ancient of days. It's the transfer of days sits because he's transferring from one eon to the next God's plan. 
Uh, his clothing is pale as snow, and the hair of his head is immaculate wool. His throne is a flaming fire, a flaring flame. <laughs> its rollers a flashing flame. Streaming is a flame in front of him and issuing from behind him. A thousand thousands are irradiating him. That's a million. And ten thousand, ten thousands are rising before him. That's like a billion. Uh, adjudication sits and the scrolls are open. This is a judgment scene with all this fire here. And the transfer of days is setting. It's a vision of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. Perceiving am I then because of the sound of the monstrous matters that the horn is declaring. Perceiving am I till the animal is dispatched. Destroyed is her frame and granted to the glowing fire. That's just talking about the fourth animal. And the remainder of the animals, the other three, their authority is caused to pass away. Yet a lengthening of life is granted to them till the stated time and season. This chapter is traditionally interpreted as nations uh, because it calls them kingdoms. But uh, the religions are a kingdom in themselves with their own hierarchies and their own rules, marching orders. But uh, it can't be talking about the nations because the nations and the other prophecies of Daniel are all destroyed when the mountain comes out of heaven representing Christ. It destroys them all together at once. But these, uh, only one of the four is destroyed and the rest are allowed to continue, but their authority is caused to pass away. Yet a lengthening of life is granted to them till the stated time and season. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Perceiving am I in the visions of the night, and behold, on the clouds of the heavens, one as a son of a mortal is arriving unto the transfer of days he reaches, and they bring him near before him. To him is granted jurisdiction and esteem and a kingdom, and all the people and leagues and language groups shall serve him. His jurisdiction is an Eonian jurisdiction, will not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be confined. Verse 15, shuddering is my spirit, mine, Daniel's, in the midst of its sheath, and the visions of my head are flustering me. I draw near to one of the risers, and as to the certainty of all this, I am petitioning him. Then he speaks to me, and the interpretation of the matter is he making known to me. A riser is a watcher. These monstrous animals, the four of them, are four kingdoms which shall perish from the earth. Yet the saints of the supremacy shall receive the kingdom, and they will safeguard the kingdom unto the eon, even unto the eon of the eons. Verse 19. Then I would know the certainty concerning the fourth animal that is diverse from all of them, redundantly terrifying, her teeth of iron, her claws of copper, devouring, pulverizing, and stamping upon the remainder with her feet. And concerning the ten horns that are on her head, and concerning another horn that comes up, and the three before it fail, even the same horn with its eyes and a mouth declaring monstrous things, and the vision of it is larger than its partners, perceiving am I, and the same horn is making an attack on the saints and is prevailing against them. Till, until the transfer of days arrives, and his adjudication is granted to the saints of the supremacies, and the stated time is reached, and the kingdom is safeguarded by the saints. And one more verse, Daniel 7.23, So as he speaks again to me, the fourth animal, it is the fourth kingdom being on the earth that is diverse from all three kingdoms. She will devour the entire earth and thresh it and pulverize it. Oh, there's another section, Daniel 7, 24 through 27. The ten horns from her kingdom are ten kings who will rise, and another one will rise after them. So this uh, ten king, these ten kings come from the fourth animal. He is diverse from the eastern. Three kings will he abase. Declarations to set aside the supreme will he declare. This is the interpretation of what we just read. Uh, to the saints of the supremacies will he bring decay. He is meaning to alter stated times and an edict, and they shall be granted into his hand unto a season and two seasons and the distribution of a season. That's three and a half years. Yet adjudication sits, and they will cause his authority to pass away, 
even to the exterminate and to destroy till the terminus. And the kingdom and the jurisdiction of the majesty of the kingdom under the entire heavens will be granted to the people of the saints of the supremacies. Their kingdom is an Ionian kingdom, and all other authorities shall serve and hearken to them. So the ten horns in this prophecy appear again in the book of the unveiling with more detail. In the unveiling, 1728, furthermore, as this is the termination of the matter, uh, I, Daniel, my ruminations greatly flustering me. My aspect is altering on me. I leave the matter in the custody of my heart. That's the wrong reference. It's uh, Daniel 7, 28. And uh, after I read that, <laughs> I leave the matter in the custody of my heart, too. <laughs> this is what I wanted to get to in the unveiling. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, blasphemy, having said seven heads and ten horns. This woman has the same description as the dragon, who has the same description as the beast. So it's, we see a correlation here. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery, the secret of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Now we're going to get an explanation. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And <clears throat> so this beast existed. He's not now, but he will ascend out of the bottomless pit. But then he's going to go to perdition. And they that dwelt on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of the life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Unveiling 17, 9 through 11. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are, here's the explanation, from God himself, through his word. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five or five. So those are the kingdoms. The seven mountains are seven kingdoms. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, at the time of Daniel writing this, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must come continue a short space, not, not all the way to the terminus, just a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. So out of these seven kingdoms, there are seven kings. And uh, the seventh haven't yet come yet at Daniel's time, at uh, the Apostle John's time. But then later, an eighth is going to come who is one of the seven. Can you see it? So here's your chart. The seven kingdoms that have oppressed God's people since uh, Assyria. No one Assyria. Two Egypt. Three Babylon. Four Medo-Persian Empire. Five Greece. Six Rome. Seven the Islamic Caliphate. That's the one that is not yet uh, in John's time. Uh, it was broken up uh, after World War I. And then the eighth is of the seven, so it's a revived something, a revived something because it is of the seven. So it has to be one of these revived. I believe it's number seven. Ergodon in Turkey is trying to has been trying for years to establish a new, he calls it a neo-Ottoman empire. Neo-Ottoman empire. So just keep that in mind. So the description given to us by God about these 
kingdoms are five are fallen. Those are the ones who fell before John's time. And one is, that's the one that was currently in power when John was writing this. The one to come, the other that is not yet come is the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire. And the eighth, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. So I believe it's a revived uh, Islamic Caliphate. I believe the Antichrist will be a Muslim. So talking about world trends, religion, and politics, unveiling 17, 12 through 14, the 10 horns talked about in Daniel, the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which shall have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind. They're of one accord. Remember I said the adversary will unify if it's for his purpose. Here you have an example of it. These have one mind and should give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This may be a reference to us returning with the lamb, with Jesus Christ when he comes back because angels are not called. Angels are not chosen, and they can be faithful, but they're not called and chosen. That's talking about people, in my estimation. Tell me what you think. In verse 15, he says unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. I told you that the waters represented the Gentile nations, people. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will. With all this going on, it's still God's will being done. God has filled their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled, until the scriptures are fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That, of course, will be Babylon. The ten kings first prophesied in Daniel will be contemporary with the beast. They form the beast kingdom. They have no kingdom singular as of yet as a group, but they must exist as individual kingdoms first. So it doesn't say they are without a kingdom. It's just the same, themselves. Each has a kingdom, but they have no kingdom, joint kingdom, singular as of yet, as a group. But they must exist as individual kingdoms first. They will be unified in their support of the beast. The only reason the adversary unifies people is so they can cohere with his plans. The person called the beast will subdue three of these kingdoms in his ascension over the kings of the earth. We read that in Daniel. Kings and kingdoms are synonymous both in Daniel and in the unveiling. So the, word, the winds of culture, there are four major religions in the world. That's Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christendom, which is the counterfeit of true Christianity. There are many more religions than the four, of course. Satanism, communism is a religion. Atheism is a religion. It's the belief there is no God. Communism is the belief that we're the brotherhood of man. <laughs> There's no brotherhood of man without God. Materialism, meism, new age, occultism, all the isms, etc. There's there's tons of them. Adversary's got something for everybody. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> In addition to religion, the adversary as Satan promotes the popular world trends in culture. The hippie movement are now the liberals running governments. Music, theater, movies, art, literature. He saturated these. The adversary has saturated these with his lies. The paras, the, uh, uh, the political parties, abortion, sexual deviancy, fashion, and art. Have you ever considered who really wrote Sympathy for the Devil? Have you ever listened to that song and seen Jagger perform it? You can tell he's possessed when he's performing it. It's, it's straight from the devil. How about Stairway to Heaven? I told you about that earlier in this session. Written in five minutes, automatic writing. How about Dante's Inferno? You know, where everybody in hell is uh, burning away and those, you know, there's, there's worse uh, torture for those who committed worse acts. 
How about Mil Milton's Paradise Lost that pictures the devil as a nice guy? <laughs> the examples of the adversary's influence in popular culture are endless, and the adversary rewards his subjects well until he has no more use for them, until he can't use them any longer. Then he disposes of them. <laughs> Everything the adversary gives comes with a cost, a price. So the adversary is working world systems at this present time to set the stage for his seed, the Antichrist. Lawlessness will continue to abound. There will be continuous war, wars and rumors of war. Deception will increase. Paul warned us about this. Lawlessness will increase. All of this will bring down the judgment of God in the person of Jesus Christ at his return. People of the earth tremble. The judgment uh, for our Lord comes executing judgment. People of God rejoice for the that adversary, the Satan, that old serpent will be cast out at the Lord's return from heaven and with his mighty messengers. So the wicked and their wickedness in the world. First John 519 King James Version. We know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The uh, ESV, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And in the concordant literal version, 1 John 5, 19, we are aware that we are of God and the whole world is lying in the wicked one. Look at that. The whole world is lying in the wicked one. The wicked one, referring to the Diablo Satan, is the opposite of the godly one, Jesus Christ. 1 John 5.19, we are aware that we are of God, and the whole world is lying in the wicked one. How has the adversary achieved such widespread influence? By working through his spirit army to influence individuals. So he works all the world systems and the governments to bring about his plan, and now it's to, to bring up the rise of his man, the Antichrist, and all those world systems affects us as individuals more than you can realize. So we must discover from God's word how to protect ourselves from the adversary's influence. And we will do that after the next session. So in the next session, we're going to expose the adversary's methods personal from a personal perspective. This was from a global perspective. I hope I've communicated it well, how he works in this world through his hierarchy of minions. Uh, and it's all to attack the person. So next week, we want to look at the adversary's methods from a personal perspective. So you are equipped and nurture those who are learning with you. And by that, I mean, pray for them and, you know, cover them with love. <laughs> so that's what I have for you tonight. The adversary's methods on a global perspective. Hi, Jessica. Uh, pursuing love through Paul's evangel. Seems to me the called would be from the tribe of Israel who are called from the disruption of the world and chosen would be the body of Christ chosen before the disruption of the world. That may be. That's good insight there. Uh, <laughs> Louis, awesome explanation, Richard. Keep it up. Alma Martinez, thanks very good. Well, thank you for your graciousness. Let me see if there's any other comments up here earlier. If you have any questions or comments, write them down now. I will try to address them best of my ability. Did you see I wrote in there, love defeats the adversary? That's true. Love is what defeats him. And where does love come from? God. He has shed his love abroad in our hearts. So we can only know that from the word. Uh, so I put a couple links in there if you haven't seen them that go further into this. Uh, Randy says, subscribe, like, and most importantly, share. Yes, let's get the word out. Yeah. Hey, Alma. Yeah, Romans 28. Well, we're both called ones from the disruption, ones early. Actually, he calls Israel as an, uh, he calls them out as a nation. Uh, he chose us individually, and he's calling us out individually now. That's the difference. 
Thank you, Kevin. He says, thank you, Richard. Very well presented. Yes, share the video. Share them. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, I'm not complaining, but it took three solid days to put that together after weeks of study just to put the presentation together. So use it. Use it uh, to God's advantage. <laughs> I pray for God to use these as he wants. If he doesn't, then that's good too. But uh, so anyway, I just love teaching God's word and sharing it. So next, uh, let's see, this is Wednesday, Saturday morning. We'll go through the adversary's methods on the personal perspective shared. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Knotts. And if you guys haven't seen Michael Knotts' channel, it's called Pursuing Love Through Paul's Evangel. Check it out. It, he's got some great word of God there, and, and he and his wife share it with loving hearts, loving hearts. Do we have any more comments, questions? Uh, by the way, I did complete last week's presentation that I got overwritten, so some of the slides were missing. So if you downloaded the presentation last week, go to the last session and download it again. It's the full presentation. There's a couple things in there I actually didn't cover because I didn't know they were in there anymore. <laughs> but I've covered them tonight, so you haven't missed anything. Alma says, thanks, very good. You're welcome, Alma. Thank you for your gracious blessing. So I will tell you that I'm going to be uh, teaching at the June conference. It's in Georgia um, at Stone Mountain Resort, I believe it's called. Uh, if you can't make it there, it'll be live streamed. Good night, Kevin. God bless you. Thanks for coming, brother. So if you want to meet me and I'll give you a hug, come on down to that uh, conference. I'll be posting information about it. I realize I shouldn't have said anything without the information here. But next time, I'll give you some information on that. And, of course, it will be live streamed. Um, uh, Martin Zenner is going to be there and a few other people I know. And uh, we're going to share God's word with people. And we're going to love everybody. Share it in love. So thank you for coming. I will see you Saturday morning. God bless. God keep you in peace and safety. Remember, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. God has us. He's got you. Have no fear. We're exposing the adversary's methods so we can even get sharper on God's word and make a dent in his kingdom. <laughs> so, good night. God bless. See you Saturday morning. Bye-bye.